All right, so uh, how many of you here have seen me speak before? I just want to gauge this thing. One, two, three. OK, you're awesome. This is easy now. So I'm going to back up and start from the beginning. I started wedding or photography, period, um, when I was 45. And that was 18 years ago. Uh, I was working on my PhD in psychology at UCLA. And um, I had three part-time jobs because at 45, I really didn't want to get loans and then oh, crazy money when I got done and pay them back. So I was a research assistant, a teaching assistant, and I also worked in a lab. I processed E6, C41, black and white. I did the old black and white methods when required, which is processed by inspection, which is a long lost art, and today I still do that. Um, we'll explain that in a little bit if you don't know what that is. And um, I was this guy's fireman at the lab that I was working. Uh, I, I printed Cibachrome, Type R, Type C, black and white. I was a copy guy. I did dupe work. Whatever this guy needed, when someone was sick in that department, they sent Joe in. And then one day, I came home, and I took a photo. I'm going to let you all copy this a little later on. This is, by the way, uh, from Steven Spielberg. He, he amended my contract, and he added this when I shot for him. He said, you need to have this. And uh, it's actually a nice piece to have in the contract the, when you get a chance. Later on, I'll put it back up. If you missed it somehow, feel free to email me, and I'll send it to you. So really quickly, now I processed the film. I printed it. I toned it. And I came home with it, and I started shaking. My hands were shaking. I was holding this print. And I'm supposed to feel that way. I was the husband. I was the father. But there was something more compelling about it. And I wasn't quite sure what it was. And of course, being in the psych program, I started digging into myself. What the heck's going on? Why am, am I so anxious when I look at this image? And what it was, was that I had inserted myself in a moment between two people that was very private. And I became part of that moment. And that, to me, was so compelling that I left the program. And I said, I'm going to figure out how to do this and make a living at it. And in that moment, I really didn't know where that was going to be. You know, Brisson has done his thing. I'm, I kind of follow some of the old masters. And I really appreciated the people that were way before me. Duano, Ruth Bernhard, uh, Caponegro, all those people that I collect. So I said, what can I possibly do? And, and, and interestingly enough, I was at two friends' weddings uh, around the same time. And I walked away from both weddings. And I said to myself, I wish I had a camera. And it was something I did in my mind. And it wasn't until this shot that I reflected back at that. And I said, what was it about I wish I had a camera in my hand during those weddings as, as a guest? And I realized, while the photographer that was hired to shoot this gig was probably pretty good, he spent two and a half hours doing formals and missed the entire story that unfolded behind him. Because back in that day, it was grip and grin. It was more about who rather than what, when, and where. So it was all you can do to put as many groupings you could put together so that you can sell a ton of 5x7s and 8x10s to all the people that were in those images. And I said, you know what? I'd like to do this, but I'd like to shoot what actually transpires at the wedding. It'll make every wedding unique, because every wedding has different stories. They unfold differently. So I said, that's what I'm after. So when I started, I thought, I'll do it with 35 millimeter. And I'm going to be kind of a photojournalist about it. And I'll go do this. And friends that were uh, in photography at that time that were shooting uh, Hasselblads came up to me and said, you're not going to make it for six months. You're, th you're flash in the pan. You'll never make it. Because it's all about medium format. It's all about big negatives. And I said, but you guys bring like all this stuff, a tripod, a whole case of power equipment with lighting. And you know they set up these lights on the dance floor in the middle of the reception. And the couple has spent thousands of dollars for the ambiance in this place, right? All the candles, the beautiful flowers, maybe the pin spotting of the lights on the tables. And then all of a sudden, they get on the dance floor in this beautiful moment. And the photographer goes, 
boom, like God has spoken and the lights go up. It's F8 at 1 25th of a second. Everything is sharp and not one candle can you see because it's drowned out by all, you know, it's sharp, it's pretty. Okay, so I said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the opposite. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna shoot available light as much as I can. And when people ask me, so do you bring lighting? Well, I'm an available light shooter and every once in a while my flash is available. That's kind of how I look at things. <laughs> so if I have to use the doggone thing, I will. And uh, I never point that thing directly at a human being though. I will always bounce my flash. I look for directional lighting from the side. Because what I try and create, I don't know if you've heard Dennis talk about this. Dennis Reggie was here yeah. a while back, okay. I try to create the third dimension when I shoot. I do the same thing Dennis does. It's highlight and shadow, and that's your depth. That's the third dimension. When you use frontal lighting, it's flat lighting, and you get lighting on both sides of the face equally, okay? If you pop that puppy up, bounce it off the ceiling or behind you and straight back, you're doing the same thing. Softer light, prettier light, still direct lighting. Window, I create a window where there isn't one. From the side, when it comes back, it lights and it gives shadow. It's awesome if you can do that. Now, how do you do that? You use fast lenses. You, you shoot at a higher ISO. And today you can. So when you guys pick up your digital cameras, I use the 5D Mark III now for digital. And I use the 1V as in Victor for film. By the way, I, I still shoot film. Film is not a four letter dirty word. Okay, I still shoot film. Okay, so when people hire me. Excuse me, sir. No, 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 I'm sorry. Here you go. When people hire me, they hire me so that I could shoot the film and that my primary shooters can shoot digitally. See, I'm the second shooter on all my jobs. Whew. Freedom. I want you to think about it. Up until two years ago, I kept hiring other people to be second shooters to me. But then the whole, the onus was on me to, to get the stuff that mom wanted, which were what? Table shots, formals, all that stuff that kept me away from the moments. My moments, that, that that's what I'm good at. So I said, what am I doing? Why am I hiring these guys that are doing what I want to do? So I go to Art Center, Brooks, anywhere I can find guys, gals, that are just coming out, that are looking for interning and or wanting a position in my company, and I hire them as the primary shooters. It's brilliant, because now I'm off the hook. They take the lead, and I want you to think about how brilliant this really is. Imagine them shooting all the formals, and Ann Zelda is there, and Uncle Henry is there. They see me just in the background, skulking away with the long lens. They don't pay attention to me because my guy, my woman, is directing all the shots. So come reception. Ann Zelda says to Uncle Henry, Henry, go get that photographer and take our photo on the dance floor. He starts to drift towards me because I was the closest guy there, right? She screams across the dance floor, Henry, no, the other one, the real one. <laughs> yes, go to the other one. It's brilliant. They totally leave me alone. So it's not that my work has gotten better, I just get more of it, okay? I just get more of it. Let me uh, throw you a slideshow. So this first one, this is film. So all these images that you're about to see, it's just, it's film-based stuff. It's a uh, Kodak 400, I like the TMY, and TMZ is my favorite, 3200. And when I said earlier, process by inspection, here's what it is. If you get 3200 film and you rate it at 3200, what really happens is this. When they process it normally, because it's 3200, you tell them, hey, it's normal. They process normal, it's under, see? It's actually about a 1000 film. But there's enough latitude in film, in this film, that covers that under. But here's what happens. You get an underdeveloped roll of film, which now when you print, you need a higher contrast paper so it doesn't look muddy. And what that does is increase the grain. That's why when you look at 3200 film, it looks very grainy. Oh yeah, it's that fast film, right? Process by inspection, under a green light, in the dark room, one roll at a time, when I think it's supposed to come out, I will look at it and go, mm, you no, know, maybe another 30 seconds, and put it back in the developer, agitate, pull it out after 30 seconds, ah, almost, 15 more, 15 seconds, pull it out, yep, density looks good, stop bath. 
process by inspection. There's no other way you can do this. So now, the stuff that you'll see, a lot of this is 3200 film, looks like 400 film, because the grain is really fine because it was processed properly. Okay. So uh, sepia toning, a little bit of uh, stuff done to it, but that's pretty much it. Uh, we ready? You want to kill those lights or no? Whatever you want to do is fine by me.
<laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> I'd like to preface with something right now. The most important thing about photography, and, 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 and granted, no your camera gear, no technology, no post-production. The most important thing about photography is who you are. I want you to think about it for a second. Take 10 photojournalists. They're sent on assignment from the different papers, television stations, and something unfolds in front of them. A moment happens. All 10 shoot it. Boom, 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 boom. Are the images the same? There's no way. Because every person that hits that shutter, hits that shutter based on who they are and when they think it's a moment for them. They use different lenses from different angles based on who they are. It's a, a very interesting phenomenon. When you leave here, I want you to go home. I want you to pick out your favorite photos you've ever taken. Not someone else, yours, that you've treasured and that you love. It's in an album, it's in a book, it's in a box, it's somewhere. And I want you to take those images into the bedroom. Lock the door. Bring a glass of wine and turn up a little music. And I want you to earnestly study those images you love so much. I'll guarantee you one thing. Eventually, you'll find yourself in every one of those photos. There's no way that any of us in this room can hit the shutter and not leave a piece of ourselves in that image. That, at some point, becomes style. When you can walk into a gallery and say, that's a Brissant from a distance without seeing the name. That's a Duano. That's, that's Annie Leibovitz. You know it because you recognize the style. It's who she is. You do the same thing. We all do. We do what we do because we are passionate about it because it's a form of expression. And believe it or not, you think you're catching moments or you're creating a portrait, you're also talking about yourself when you create the image. I'm gonna give you a little TMI now. When I was four and a half, my mother left me on the doorstep in Indonesia of a house. Didn't know who this person was. With a suitcase, a pillow, and my one and a half year old sister in my arms and she said don't leave until someone finds you and she drove off is the last time I saw her my father came in five hours later I was frozen stiff on that cement block because I was scared to leave it he happened to come home and see me down the street he then thought we needed a mother so he married the evil wicked stepmother who beat me on a daily basis, who locked me in closets, who starved me, kept me from food to punish me because I was a rebellious little dude. Because I fought back. The harder she hit me, the more I stood up. I never grew up with role models of what a husband and a wife is supposed to look like, what a mother and a father should look like. So I'm now, I go to weddings because that little five-year-old in me is being nurtured when he's around all the love that he sees at weddings. And people ask me, how come your stuff is so emotional? It's because I am. It's what I thirst for. It's what I see. It's what I feel. It's what I gravitate toward. It's what I respond to with the shutter when I see it or feel it. It's who I am. So when you look at the images, it's not just about the moment. It's how I feel about that moment. That's also in there. That's all of you. Every last one of you is the same. Who you are today, what has brought you here to this time in your life, is put into your imagery when you shoot. Don't you think when you look at a photo in a gallery, it's, it's a three-way conversation, right? It's about the subject matter. It's about you viewing. But it's also about the invisible, the person that took it. Think about it. It's an awesome, awesome thing to find out. If you want to figure out what your style is, find out who you are. Why you shoot that way. 
Recently, I started shooting the same thing over and over, and I couldn't figure out why am I now, okay, I know I'm second shooter, but I like following the bride from behind, low crouch behind her, she's walking down the aisle, so I can see his face. When he first sees her, I want to nail that puppy over her shoulder and duck back down, and I use the excuse, I'm ducking back down because I don't want my primary shooter to have me in his pictures all the time. So that made sense, right? No, it's actually more than that. That evil, wicked stepmother, whenever she'd have a party at the house and adults would come over, she would lock me in my bedroom because she told me kids are not to be seen or heard. So she would lock me away. I, I figured out Jimmy to lock once. And I snuck out. I crawled on all fours through the hallway. I sat behind the couch and I would listen to their laughter and what they were saying. I would peek once in a while and duck back down. I totally got away with it. Okay? That's me at the wedding behind that bride. It's the same darn little dude that's ducking behind, sneaking a peek over the shoulder, nailing a shot, and ducking back down again. The same thing. It's, 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 there are images in here that I'll, I'll, when I get to it, I'll, I'll show it to you. But I'd like to go through a couple of these. Uh, I shot this a few years ago, and I entered in a print competition at WPPI. It bombed. It did 71 or some god-awful number, and I was so upset. You have no idea. I knew the judges. I said, are you guys crazy? Look how beautiful that moment is. That's the first dance. It's so beautiful. No, it's soft, Joe. Dude, it, who cares? What do you want, F64? He says, no, Joe, it's out of focus. I'm telling you, there's one hair in there that's tack sharp. I swear to God. Take a really close look. No, Joe, it's soft. All right. This is the point that I went home. I showed this to the bride. She wept. A hundred! That was the grand award right there. She wept. I said, why are you crying? She says, well, this was our first dance. This image brings back what I was feeling in that particular moment. 250 people on the dance floor. I don't remember what the heck was going on. I do remember, looking at this image, how I was feeling in that moment. And she wept. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. I want them to open up their books 20 years later and go, oh, I remember what I was thinking in that moment, or I remember what I was feeling in that moment. That's my job, I think, as a photographer for my clients. And by the way, that's what I sell when I pitch myself. I'm going to ask you something. For a lot of people, I hear back and forth, what can I do different? Well, my question to you is, how? different are you from everybody around you? How do you separate yourself from the masses when everybody pitches the, the slideshows or whatever it is they do and they, they, they crunch the numbers and they hand sheets out to their clients as to how much their packages are worth? Um, how, how do you separate yourself? Because again, who you are is the most important thing about photography, right? So when I have a client sitting in front of me, I, I don't sell my work. She's not there to, for me to sell my work to. I have a perfect opportunity to sell me, the person. The work sells itself. She either likes this or she doesn't. Where does she see it? On the internet, on, on my website. She sees yours on the website. She narrows down to three, four people that sh whose work she likes. Now she goes in, and half the time, the bride doesn't know really why she's sitting in front of you, except to find out how much are you. But really, what is she there for? To find out who you are. What kind of a person are you? So now, instead of selling the work, the slideshows, and the yada, 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 sell you. You can sell on three different levels. You can be a commodity solely based on price. The lowest package gets the job. And here's what you'll find usually is the client will say, you know, well, Mr. A and Ms. B will do it for 100 bucks less. Hey, I'll match that, and I'll even throw in this. And then you get the job. OK, that's a commodity. You can step it up from there, you can be a service. You now provide slideshows, you'll do album consultations, you'll do a few other things, you're a service. However, the primo, the top, you can be an experience. I sell myself as an experience. All right, let me give you an example. You got Four Seasons Hotel or the Ritz, and you got maybe what, four or five hundred bucks a night? Okay. Hey, I'm over at the, the, what is that, the Trip Hotel down the street here? 
450 bucks a night. Or there's Motel 6, $69 a night. Both of them have beds. Why the heck would I spend 450 bucks if I can get it for $69? Well, if I go to the Ritz in LA, here's why. I will drive up in the front. Some guy will come out to greet me at the car. He's got a little walkie-talkie thing going on on his wrist. He pops the trunk. He sees my name on the bags. He goes, it's Mr. Busink. Front desk goes, da -da 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 -da. he was here six months ago. He opens my door. Welcome back, Mr. Busink. And he bends. He bows. He lets me out. And I go, wow, how do you know my name? B, how did he know I was here before? That's pretty cool. I walk up to the front desk. Excuse me, ma'am. Where's your bathroom? Motel 6. Yeah, if you walk down the hall, that first hallway right there, hang a right. Across from the elevators, there's a bathroom. Okay? Ritz, the lady steps out from behind the desk. Follow me, sir. Walks me to the front of the bathroom, bows and says, Have a great day, Mr. Busink. Wow, I'm paying $4.50 for this, man. Yeah, every time. If I have the money, right? I'm trying to attract a clientele that understands the difference and can pay for it. Okay, that's what I'm after. The people that have money, it's, it's, it's a mindset, okay? It's not bad, worse, it's none of that. It's, it's for the clients that are up there that have that kind of money, this is just another day in their, their, their beautiful lives that they have, okay? Uh, and, and so they will pay for that if, if they see the difference. So I pitch them differently. I pitch them who I am. You want to hire me on your day because of who I am. Not because my work is great or anything like that. You got to like it. It's got to be good enough to, okay, he's in the ballpark. But now I sell me. A few months ago, a woman from New York called me up, says, I got to hire you. Are you open for this day? And I go, I look up, yes, I am. And I like meeting my clients beforehand because I want that interaction. I'm trying to sell who I am. I want them to get to know me. So by the time I get to their wedding, they open up like books to me because I'm Cousin Joe. I'm Uncle Joe. I'm somebody that they already know because of who I am. So I, I, I'm, she's hurrying through this thing. She's throwing a credit card at me already. I want to book it right now. I said, why are you in such a rush? I, I would like to meet you. Oh, no, no, no. I'm flying out to LA. I do want to meet you, but I need to book you right now. I said, I'm just really curious. Why the urgency? She said, well, I want to be photographed by someone who loves women as much as you do. What? She was able to look on my site and determine that I loved women. OK, guilty. <laughs> totally guilty. It is who I am. And she picked it up in looking at the work. So I'm telling you, your work will speak volumes about who you are to some people who recognize it, to others you can pitch to so that they do recognize it. And that's where, in part, you can separate yourself from everybody else. Because now you're no longer pitching the packages only kind of scenario where it's all about money, or uh, you know uh, the amount of hours you'll spend there, or what, what, whatever it is, slideshows that you'll give, whatever it is. Interestingly enough, uh, a while back, a photographer asked me, how do you manage to sell these prints that you do? Because I sell my prints to all my clients. They buy my prints. I said, well, tell me, how do you pitch your work? And he said to me, well, they come in. I put them down. I have a big 60-inch flat screen TV. We throw on some slideshows. Uh, after the slideshows, we talk a little bit about the money, the packages. Then I put books in front of them, albums in front of them, you know, and they, they look at them. And, and then I said to him, so what do they buy when, when they come back at you? If they hire you, what do they buy? Well, they all want slideshows, and I hate selling slideshows. Really. They buy what you show them. If you show them slideshows and they hire you, that's what they'll want. So what I do when I pitch them, one print at a time, I tell a story about it. Every print has a signature on it, because you know, once you sign your work, it's art. OK, it's just a suggestion. I'm not, I don't call it art. I don't call myself an artist. I suggest. I sign all my books. Notice I call them books. They're not albums. They're books. They're different. In the back, on the back page, which is black, I sign in silver. 
If there are three, two parents' books, one bride, it's one of three, two of three, three of three, and AP in front of it, which stands for artist proof. Okay, just a suggestion. When they go to galleries, when you go, you go to museums, people have their signature on their work. So I'm merely planting a seed. So they see these sign prints, they, they hear my story, and what they hear is what you're hearing now. It's my passion for this. And while I'm talking about the image, they're getting a feel for who I am and why I do what I do. I love what I do. It is my passion. And wouldn't you, at your wedding, want someone who doesn't look at this as a job, that's absolutely wanting to be there, that it's a blessing and an honor for that person to be there. And I do treat it that way. Yes, it's the most, one of the most important days of their lives. They're going to want someone there that feels as powerful about it as they do. OK, so that one pff, bombed. I was very upset about it. Um, Ask me a question. Going back to that photo, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I see the love in the air. And I can understand why the um, bride was crying. What, what would you do to the bride with, like, that's not charm? And I, I, I find that sometimes my clients, like, point out things. And I'm like, you're missing the picture. But like, Now back up to what I said a second ago. Ready? I show that print. That bride is either going to say to me, oh my gosh. Or she's going to say, wow, it's a little soft. Oop, my question next. I show her a few more of those, and I get an idea that she doesn't like those. A, we're either not the right match, or B, that's not the kind of imagery that I can give her. So I show this kind of stuff. Like I'm showing you now, I show my clients all of these. And they either connect. By the fourth image, if that bride's got tears rolling down her face, and goes, oh my God, it's not even my wedding, and I'm crying, I'm sorry. Oh, that's my bride. That is my bride. Yeah? I know it in, in, in two seconds flat. Yeah. Did you set out to shoot that soft, or did you have other images that were sharper than that? No, nah, they were all out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> You're more into capturing the moment. Yeah, I will, the... I will sacrifice sharpness any time to capture the moment. Any time. Because the difference would be, can you guys hold it for a second? OK, now look towards me for a second. Boom, gotcha. No, I don't want that. And it, it very well would be sharp, but now they're smiling into the camera, and, and they're camera aware, and it's completely a different shot. Here's what I want. Uncle Henry's in the back of the church. It's an hour-long Catholic mass. He's bored just out of his mind, okay? He starts to drift up, and he's going, oh my goodness, those frescoes painted on the ceiling, God looking down, the angels, and you, know, you can see, in his, and I come over, and I got my lens, and I do this, and he sees me, here's what he does, <gasps> hold on, and he brings over Harriet, and he goes, okay, now the picture comes back, hey Harriet, photo of us, oh lovely Henry, lovely, okay, but how about if I do this, I see that, Long lens, it's a slow shutter speed. I know I'm dragging the shutter a little bit. I'm taking a chance. Boom, nail it. And then he catches me and he goes, oh, that was sneaky. I go, yes, it was. <laughs> the picture comes back. And it may well be slightly soft, but it's this one. What does he say? Harriet, do you remember those paintings in the ceiling? Thoughts, feelings all come flooding back, even slightly out of focus because I managed to capture that moment where he remembers what he was feeling, what he was looking at, and that's what I want. That's what I'm after. And I'll, I'll tell you a little later on when, when, you, when you get the chance, ask me about that whole P mode thing and why I do it that way. It is, I sacrifice a lot, and remember, I shoot film, right? And I've tried this, looking on the back of my film camera to see what the hell I just got. <laughs> because sometimes I'm between my digital and my film, and I'm like, huh? So there's things, for us film shooters, and there's a bunch in this room that, that, that know film, you have to be good. Today, what I get a lot is you don't really need to be so good, because I can fix it later. You see, the, the mindset is slightly different. We used to be really bothered in LA. We used to be this, this scenario of shoot and burn. Do you guys ever get that here? Where you go shoot a wedding, and at the end of it, it's 700 bucks. At the end of the day, before you leave, you bring your laptop out, and you burn a disk of the images. All JPEGs, boom, here it is, I'm done, out of here. 
That's called shoot and burn. And that's what we were competing with. These were the Uncle Bobs that we lovingly refer to as those that look over the shoulder now. I can be a photographer because I got an iPhone. Um, but they would bring out their, break out their rebel cameras, and they were really good, um, and would do that, shoot and burn. OK, we dealt with that. No longer does that really exist anymore because the client has gotten smart. They've gotten junk. They got junk for work that they had to get fixed and spend a couple thousand dollars getting them tweaked and fixed because they were just really bad, bad imagers, okay? Then a new thing came on, and I got on the soapbox about this. Spray and pray. It's in raw. It's eight frames a second. <laughs> Lord, let there be one, because I have no idea what I'm doing. You see, because our post-production tools are so darn good, the cameras are so good, that you can actually get away with some of that stuff. You can actually say, you know what, I've blown it. <sighs> Let me fix it. And, and that's, that's the problem. And, and when people think that there's a silver bullet to this thing called success, th there isn't one, not, not, not as far as I know. It's hard work. It's dedication. It's knowing your gear. I shoot in P mode because when I shoot, that camera is, is part of my arm, my heart, my eye, and it's all connected. I know that camera so well inside and out that I know when it will fail me and how to correct for it on the fly without thinking about it. If I have to look down, change some buttons, think about it, I've missed four moments that unfolded in front of me. And by the way, those of the people that are just barely learning and think they can shoot an entire wedding because they, they have the, 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 the good gear, they can look on the back of the camera and they shoot. And do you ever see this one? Click, look, click, look, click, look, every frame, look, and then wait, let's blow it up, roll it this way. Yeah, now roll it this way. Because they're insecure. They don't know what they're doing. And there's a reason they call that chimping. You know, they used to call that chimping, looking on the back of the skin. And it's not like, it's like cheating, right? It's not really, if you think about it. It's <laughs> Because to, to all the people looking at these professional photographers just looking on their screens, you, you look like monkeys, man. But what that screen teaches you at some level is insecurity. When my shooters work for me, the first thing I do on a job for them is tape up the screen. Oh, they hate me. They, they really want to look at it, but I use gaffer's tape, and I blacken out that entire screen. Sorry. Pretend you're shooting film. Let me see how you can do this. Let me see how well you know that camera, really, truly. Because that, if you then take what's already captured beautifully in camera and enhance it, it's another story. Not fix it, enhance it. Absolutely make it beautiful. But it's not a fix it thing. You know, a few years ago, WPPI, I, I was a judge, a chair for the judging department in, in photojournalism. And a couple of images, two years in a row, that one were so powerful in PJ that blew our minds. It was so beautiful. And, and lucky for us that the photographers that won the Grand Awards in PJ came forth and said, actually, it wasn't a real moment. It was a composite. I did it in Photoshop. They took four images and made a composite into one moment. The whole thing was fabricated. The, and you couldn't tell. It's so good now, you really can't, you can look at it all you want. They can tweak the lighting on it to make it look all very seamless. And they were straight up. So now, we instituted a policy, I started pushing for this, show me the raw file with the metadata. That's the only way you can enter PJ now in, at WPPI. Here's the print. Show me the raw file. I want to see what was done to it. And if you enhanced it, you kept everything clean, it stays. If you've moved some things around or there's some things that weren't present in the raw file that's in the, uh-uh, that's out. But that's how good it's getting, OK? Now, I always say this, and I, I do mean it. And I see, it almost sounds a little, well, it is crude. So I'm going to just say it very quickly. If it's crap going in, it's going to be crap coming out. It's just a little dressed up crap, that's all, OK? So just know that I think what you need to be after. How many of you here have read your entire camera manual front to back? All right, a handful. Good for you. You know how much info is in that thing? 
Huh, all the custom functions? I don't care if it's Nikon, Olympus, <laughs> Canon, it doesn't matter. It tells you how to use that. Now practice with it over and over and over until it's second nature and you don't have to think about it anymore. And that is why I shoot in P mode. Because what I endeavor to do when I go to a wedding is to not think at all. Because that's how I can be in the moment. That's when I become part of that moment. Because if I have to think about it, I'm out. I'm no longer catching the moments. And that's why I have primary shooters. So that, that's all I can do is stay in moments, drift in and out of them, dance with them. I, I, I love it. It's who I am. But I can only do it if I know that camera that well. Now, do I fail? Heck yeah. I come home with 1,500 images. My primary comes home with 1,500 images. We have 3,000 between us. My wife, because I want a woman to edit it, I want a woman to look at it for a woman, she kills off 2,300 of my babes. Because <laughs> they're babies to me, man. So she has no mercy, 700, 600 sometimes. And I'll go, oh, but, 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 but that, that one? She says, no, Joe, it's crap. <laughs> Oh, no, come on, I love that shot. No, that sucks. So I wait till she goes to sleep. <laughs> I sneak it back into my file, or my folder, and I'll slide a couple of those back in. But 700, and if the book has 50, imagine that the client has to kill off another 650. And they've got seven, I gotta tell you, they got 700 amazing images already. And just really quickly for MJ's wedding, I came home with 4,000 images. Me, I shot 4,000. Six hours on the rehearsal, 15 hours of the wedding, okay? My guys came home with 8,000 each. I had two shooters on it. We have 20,000 images. My wife says, he's gonna see about 2,000 of these. She's gonna kill off 18,000 images. Just click, 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 click. We don't use Photoshop. I don't allow my studio to use it. There is no Photoshop ever for anything. There's Lightroom. That's it. That's all we do. Now, do we have the occasional? Yes, but you know what? You need to take it to the lab. They'll Photoshop it for you. I literally don't touch that thing. OK, so let's go back to a couple of these. Can you see the groom's face? Nope. Okay, now I can't either, but I, you will in a second. All right, can you see his face? Look really hard. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. <gasps> Honey, don't cry. He's weeping. Alligator tears. Mom is crying. Aunt is crying. But look at the bride's face. She's looking at him like he's weeping. And he was. Power of photography. You can read into it. You can extract story after story after story. It's a wonderful thing. I, I, I shoot a ton of Jewish weddings. I shoot a ton of Orthodox Jewish weddings. I love them. The fact that there's so much tradition, and it's so beautiful. And you know, guys were on one side, girls were on the other, and here comes fourth generation. Third, second, first, all in a row. And he decided to sit with daddy. She decided. What an awesome moment. 3,200 film, 80, 70 to 200 lens from across the way, done. There are grab shots. Bride coming down a set of stairs in Miami at the Vizcaya. And for a second, I don't want to post photo. Because when you do this, just like with Uncle Henry in the church, you get the camera persona. When they recognize that you're pointing a camera, they all put on that camera persona, including the one they hate that they see all the time of themselves. I don't look good in photos. Well, yeah, because you're making the same face the minute I do this. I get that. So the idea is to grab camera unaware shots. And that's why I shoot the way I do. So sometimes I can't do it because she sees that I'm there. So all I did here was, hey, Elizabeth, how are you feeling right now? And she looks down, boom, there's my shot. It's that fast. It's that quick. She drift. I made her think about something. Try something. Here's a thought. Formals, OK? You set them all up, 
And I see this often, and I train my primary shooters never to ever do this in front of me, where he says to the groom, okay, you guys just got married, do me a favor, Robert, will you dip Elizabeth? And he dips her, he says, okay, look deep into his eyes. Oh my God, I know what he's trying to do. He's trying to, you know, elicit an emotion, right? He wants them to look beautiful. Oh, you got, they just got married. He's all you gotta do. Hey, you guys, how you feeling right now? You got five seconds to shoot. Because the minute you ask them how they're feeling, they access their heart and they pour it out. She looks shyly down. He reaches over, touches her face, click, click. You can't possibly post that kind of stuff. Because when you do it, it's you that is posing them. It is your idea of how they should look. Not theirs. But if you ask them a question, they will tell you how they feel. They will show you how they feel. And you document that. Really quick, one, two, three. I go to engagement sessions. Where did he propose? Ah, oh, that little restaurant. Okay, let's go there. Where were you guys sitting? Okay, have a seat. So um, tell me, Elizabeth, and my camera's down here. And uh, I shoot with a 1635 when I do this, and I'm this close. Don't do this with a 70 to 200. <laughs> that doesn't work so good. So tell me, how, how did it go, Elizabeth? So the minute I say, how did it go, she what? Retrieves memories. She goes back. Yeah, we were sitting here. I had no idea. Click. So as she's kind of living this again and bringing it out, I'm shooting from right here. I know, 16 millimeter, I know where it is. And even if I'm off a little bit, I'll crop a little bit, but I'm here. Because the minute I do this, everything changes. The minute this thing comes here, it changes. So I'm from right here. And I will walk through an aisle in the middle of the ceremony and hi, click. And while I'm looking this way, click, I'm shooting over here. I know exactly at the core of my eye where she's at, what she's doing, what, who she's talking to, and I'm grabbing shots. Because the minute I do this, body language changes. Haven't you ever seen that? Everybody all of a sudden shifts and they smile at the camera. <laughs> right. So, so, Robert, what did you do? Oh, man, you know what? I, I had the waiter bring the ring in a champagne glass. She had no idea. Wow. And I'm talking. I'm interacting with him. So did you catch it, Elizabeth? How, did you find it? Oh man, I look down and click. I nail all these expressions, all the emotion that comes back that they're retrieving because I'm interacting with them. I'm just speaking with them. And the engagement session is over in like five, 10 minutes. And I've gotten who they are, how they feel about each other without me having to say a word on how to do it. And the same thing's true at the wedding ceremony. I don't tell them how they should look they will tell me how they feel. Okay, not that I'm passionate about any of this stuff. But, you know, just, uh, let's see a couple other ones then, and then we'll show you some more slideshows. This is a, a guy named Robert. He's a commercial photographer in Los Angeles, and he has an old fire station in downtown that he bought a long time ago. That's his studio. And he used to shoot all the Budweiser ads, and uh, you know he did all the bikini-clad girls with the Clydesdales and all that stuff. So I, I shot this wedding. He was a very stoic kind of a guy, a very manly man. And he never was very emotional. And I never got that he was a very emotional guy until this moment when she was saying her vows. And I managed to nail him on it. And I just fell in love with who he was because he just couldn't hold it back anymore. And I thought that was a beautiful moment. So lo and behold, a few years ago, I'm teaching a workshop for Julia Dean. It's a week-long workshop. Robert walks in. I hadn't seen him in like 10 years. I said, Robert, what are you doing here? He goes, well, you know, commercial photography, pfft, down the toilet. It's all lifestyle stuff by Getty Images, whatever. So I thought, I, I, we love our book and how you shot. And I'm wondering, maybe I could be a wedding photographer. I said, have a seat. Come on, take my workshop. He sat front row. Didn't know that I was going to show this. So up pops this image, and I happen to look at him. Robert, do you remember this? And he started crying. He wept on the spot 10 years later after his wedding when he saw this image. That's how powerful this can be. And that, in, in the way that I work, is what I want to give my clients. That is what makes me different from everybody else. And that's what people hire me for. And what happens when people hire me to do this type of work, it's hands off. I no longer get dictated to. I no longer get the shot list. I get none of that. 
if we're paying you this much money, Joe, we want exactly how you do it. So tell us what you need from us. I said, I just need you to be you. And so it's very, 15 minutes of formals, we're done. 15 minutes. It's very, very minimal how much I do in terms of formals. So I give an 8 by 10 that I print with the signature when the bride, this is the bride during the ceremony, had no idea her husband looked at her like that. She never saw it. I did. I bring that to her. That's the other thing that we do as photojournalists, is we bring them moments they were never aware of, that they were never privy to, you know, to at all. So I sepia tone it. It does two things. One, thank you so much for allowing me the privilege, the honor, and the blessing to be on one of the most important days of your lives. It's a thank you. Two, educating. I let them know this is what final printing looks like. It's vignetted slightly, there's a little dodging and burning going on, and a sepia tone was put to it. So she knows that all the images in her book, when she orders it, will have fine touches done like this. So it's a form of education. <laughs> Plus, for me, it's advertising, because don't you know she goes home with that? Shows it to her bridesmaids, her, her family. Look what my photographer gave me. A beautiful moment that she was never aware of, right? Because who at the wedding is my next set of brides and grooms? The bridal party. It's the bridal party, because most of them are single. He does look like a serial killer, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. No, he loves her very, very much. Christina Applegate, she put the veil on. Hey, Christina, click. The second shot I have of her is her smiling from ear to ear. Now she's camera aware. That first time when I mentioned her name, she looked over, boom, gotcha. Too late, can't respond anymore. I want the essence of the person in the moment. That is what I'm after, the essence of who they are. And that can only be done camera unaware as much as possible. Because the minute they know you're doing it, camera persona comes out. It's no longer whatever she's feeling or thinking. Uh, this was her in the car. She was driving across the street. I whistled at her to look out of the car. And boom, she turned, gotcha. See the little five-year-old in me? That's the kind of stuff I drift towards. I, they're beautiful moments like that for me. Everybody crying. Lipstick on dad's cheek. <laughs> yeah, you know, just beautiful stuff. We know Christina Aguilera. You know these guys? Yeah. What was she thinking when she did that hair? Huh? Come on. She, she, said, she said it afterwards. She says, I don't know what I was thinking. I said, I didn't know either. I tried to tell you. I was trying to make a statement, Joe. I said, you did. Ah, this... This is, um, no, it's not spelling. It's, uh, yeah, see how many I've done? Uh, Jenny Garth, Peter Facinelli. Yeah, Jenny Garth, uh, 90210, I think, right? Wasn't she in that? Yeah. And then we know her, Jessica Simpson. Uh, let me see, is there any others here really quickly? Yeah. Wait, you, okay, so the Jenny Garth one? Okay, so th this one here, right here? Yeah, so the question was, what in this one? What do you, what? Oh, the other one, Je yeah, with Jen? All right, all right, right, I got you, I got you. This one, right. Yeah, so no, she was getting ready and I was standing on a table. And she was looking in a mirror, and I said, if I get her to look up at me right now, beautiful. Sometimes I get brides in front of me that aren't very comfortable in their own skin because they're 100 pounds over where they'd like to be. Okay? Joe, I love your work, but I'm not J-Lo. I, I, I get you. But what I'm after, Heather, is what's in here. And you're beautiful in there. Uh, you may not know it, but I'm going to find you on the day of the wedding. So I might see a scenario as she's getting dressed where she's already decked out. She's sitting down, putting on the final touches of makeup on, and she's looking in the mirror, and I'm saying, there's my shot. 
She said to me before, look, I don't like my triple chins. I, I'm really bothered by it. Okay, okay. Chair comes out. I take my shoes off. I get up. Hey, Heather. And she looks up. Boom. And here's where digital is brilliant. I now pop that screen on and I show it to her. She goes, oh, is that me? Yeah, that's how I see you. I didn't stand on the chair and say, Heather, look up here. I'm trying to lose your chins. <laughs> but I know as a photographer, that's what I need her to do. Look up so that she removes this. Yes? Without saying a word, because that's my job. And then when she sees that image and she sees that I get it, that I understand that that's who she is in here, maybe not on the outside, but I figured out how to get her on the inside. This is based in trust. If they figure out that you're there, not for the paycheck, but for them, they'll open up to you. I'm not brilliant at this stuff. I'm allowed to see it. I'm allowed in because they get why I do this. If it has to be a nine to five, a paycheck at the end of the week, it's another story. And your work will suffer if you come from this place. And I understand that this is a business, but first and foremost, it's your passion. Every person in this room picked up a camera because they loved it. There was something compelling about that camera. And you fell in love with photographing, whatever it is come from that place. Figure out where that was before you have to figure out how to put food on the table. Because we got to do that too. It is a business. But what happens to a lot of us, and this is why we have burnout, is it becomes all about business. The passion stuck on the back burner. You're going to try to figure out how to put food on for next week. So you stop thinking about the passion. How am I going to get my next dollar? Who do I got to argue with? And it's bang, 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 bang. And your work suffers because of it because you're having to think of it as a job. If you can just come back to that place that you started with, the passion that you felt for it, it's another story. Um, okay, was, was there someone had a question about this one? It's available light, it was a sliding glass door, I opened it up, you guys stand. Peter said, listen, I'm really tired, can I just sit? Sure, sit. That, that's about as much directing as I'll do. I, he just sat where he wanted to sit. There's no posing. I didn't adjust him. Get comfortable. He did. All right. What I'm after is the moment between moments. The perfect moment. We spend so much time now with all our tools to create the perfect image. Let me tell you something. It doesn't exist. There's no, here's my quote, there's no such thing as a perfect image, only a perfect moment. What I want is that one in between all the others. The moment before this, she was looking into his eyes as he sang the vow. The moment after this, she looked back into his eyes. For this split second, she looked down and I'm reading into this because that's who I am. I love you so much, I can't look at you anymore. That's what I see in here. <laughs> I love you so much, I just can't do it. He's got a little smile creeping on his face because he's seeing how she's reacting to it. What he's saying to her. They wrote their own vows. It was a beautiful moment. The moment between, that's what I'm after. And you know what? At eight frames a second, you'll miss it. You'll miss it. It's between number 16 and 15. I swear to God, it is. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you go so much for the feeling couple, but the question under, when you're using P, do you use the spot meter or do you use, yeah. how do you use P? Okay, let's this yeah, so the question was, how do I use P? What, do I use spot metering, what do I do? Okay, remember that I don't want to think, so I'm making my camera totally idiot proof because I'm the idiot, okay, trust me. And I'm 63, I, I can't remember what setting I've got it on anymore, and I forget and I'll just blaze a trail because I'm in the moments and I forget where I'm at, and if I'm not looking at my camera because I'm shooting film, I just toasted two rolls of film. Okay, so here's what I do. And I want you to imagine that back window right there is backlit, it's the sun coming through, and the bride's getting dressed in there, and she's sideways, it's a silhouette, I'm in P mode, I love it because I know what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? She's going to be underexposed, right? You're going to see a silhouette because the meter is going to read all that light and expose for that light, boom, give you a high f-stop, high shutter speed, and you got a silhouette. Great! So I'm cool with that until she turns towards me. 
Now I don't have that profile, the nose, the lips, I don't see any of that. She turns to, I got a black blob. So here's where Mr. M comes in and says, see, this is why we shoot M, Joe, because here's why we do this. If that's the case, I'll take a reading, I'll open it up, I'll go back until it's dead on after about five frames, and then I'm there the whole time. And every shot's virtually the same. He's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Bing, 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 bing is good. But where is she getting ready? She's getting ready in her room. What's behind Mr. M? There's a door. The door opens up, and it's Dad. <gasps> Christina! Mr. M whips around in M and goes, oops. <laughs> I be in M. And misses the shot. P mode. I use, for Nikon people, matrix metering, Canon people, evaluative metering. I never take it off. I've never taken it off of the metering. Because in that scenario right there, I find average metering. So I see half. I do a scene selection. I'll even zoom in if I have to. Because on the back of that camera is an AE lock that locks your meter. Yes? Yeah, Both yeah. cameras have it. OK? All of them do. So I know from experience, from having practiced this, because this, hey, all of you can do what I'm about to tell you. But it's going to require you to practice okay, over and over until you understand 18% gray, till you understand where in this scene is average metering, where spot. Average metering in this scenario that I'm explaining to you, half of the viewfinder is that window with the light. The other half is the carpet where it drifts off, okay? Lock the meter, come back up. But I know I want more. I want spot metering because that meter is still going to be a little fooled, right? So now I go completely into the carpet. If it's too bright, I find that wall, lock in on it, come back, and I am virtually in M as long as my thumb is on that AE lock. Bang, 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 all day long. The door opens up. Christina, I let go of the button. I whip around. I'm in P mode. Nailed him. Perfect exposure. Camera adjusts so quickly, it makes my head spin, right? That's the beauty of these things. And, and, and you know, people still think that I'm dumbing down. I'm using professional cameras, and I'm shooting P mode. Duh. Excuse me. Why do you think Nikon, or Canon, or any of them, Sony, put in a P mode in a professional camera? If it's for dummies and amateurs, why the hell stick it in a pro, pro camera? Because if you know how to use it, it's brilliant. It stops you from having to think. You override it. You want, you, OK, here, even in this scenario, so it says 6.3 as I'm locked on. And I want 2.8 instead, because I'm doing selective focusing. Fine. I dial the front. All I need is these two fingers. Front. I can select the shutter speed or the f-stop right here on the front dial while I've locked the meter in. You understand? I can control everything with these two fingers, let go of them, and I'm right back in P mode looking and feeling the things that I want to do. That's how brilliant the gear is today. It is so fast, and it is so smart. And there are times when it will fail you. And you need to figure out how to override those times very simply, without a whole lot of fanfare. So instead of going completely to manual and trying, you know what, when I shoot and there is no PJ going on, uh, I'm shooting a, a boudoir session, yes, do I need to have P on? Heck no, I'm in manual. Because I'm shooting the one thing that I'm, it's in front of me and the lighting's perfect. I want everything to look the same, less post-production, awesome. I'm not going to work with, oh, Christina. That's not going to happen, right? So yes, I use M. But at a wedding, when I'm totally photojournalist kind of a mode, I use P mode all the way. So that's how. So I can lock in. And I can do whatever I need to simply with these two fingers. And then when I let go of them, it defaults. It's, it's brilliant. OK. Can I ask a question? Ask me. So do you, cho you choose, the, not the film, when you're doing um, digital, you do black and white and, and the sepia. Is, is, it, is that to bring out more emotion? Or like why are you no, it, OK. That's for my film stuff. Oh, this yeah. Is all yeah, this is all film, right? Uh, and I picked that because people have asked me, well, first thing, how about this? Let's start with this. Joe, why are you shooting film? Everybody's digital. Are you crazy? Um, remember, I want to be different. If I'm the only idiot left shooting film at the end of the day, 
who's different? If everybody else is shooting digital, everybody has Photoshop, the same action, same filters, and I'm shooting film, doing analog, the old-fashioned way and printing it, who's different? And who's going to pay for that difference? Uh, the people that have money. Uh, Spielberg will pay for it. JLo will pay for it. D those, that's my clients. That's who I want. I want a very tiny part of that market. I'm not looking for a large part of the market. It's just me. And I want that little segment that can tell the difference, that will pay for the difference. And so that's why black and white film. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's times where the client said, can't you just shoot digital, Joe, and convert it? Absolutely, I can. Yeah. And I will do that. I shoot digital as well. Yeah. And I will show you digital now in a second. Um, here's one. LA photographer saw this and said, dude, you forgot to turn on your flash. I can't see her. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but had she turned towards me, he had a point, right? That's what I was talking about. I like the profile. I like mom holding that mirror. I like that I can't really see anything in there, but that's just me. It's my taste in the way this was. This was shot in P mode. I know fully well because of how this was lit, backlit, that she'd be a silhouette. I liked it just fine without having to think about it. It is exactly how it was captured on camera. Now she turns towards me. Now it's a different story. Because if I just see a blob that's black with no definition, I can't see eyes, I can't see a nose, OK, I'm in a different zone. Now I'm going to meet her somewhere else, come back up, and fire, and overexpose it. OK. This is split toning, sepia and blue toning. I can go and dive into all the technical stuff as to why this works this way. Sepia adheres to the highlights first, then it goes into shadow details. The blue tone goes into shadow details first before it attacks the highlights. So being very careful, one tone at a time, as soon as the highlights are done in sepia and it starts to drift into the shadow detail, you pull it, wash it, you throw it in the blue toner. So now you have what they call a split tone. Sepia and blue, and it's beautiful. So this is uh, one of my brides. And after the ceremony, before we went on to the reception, I saw this clump of trees. So I'm not always a PJ guy. And I just, in my mind's eye, I wanted her walking through the trees. So I said, before you get in the limo, can you do me a favor? I have this shot in my head. Can you walk through the trees? And she said, but Joe, my dress. I said, be careful. <laughs> That's her being careful. And I have Alice in Wonderland. I didn't say, stick out your toe, pull up your dress. I just told her, be careful. Don't ruin the dress. And she did. She was very careful not to do that. Those, that's how they're shaped. No, I love that yeah, they're shape. really cool, right? So this is in Beverly Hills. Actually, Rodeo Drive is right here. This is a jogging path on this end. There were cars everywhere, joggers going by. But right in here, for, for just this little bit, there was nothing that you could tell that she wasn't in some enchanted forest. It was really cool, and that's why that was in my mind. As she came down the steps from the church, I said, you have to walk through there. I, it's just a shot I have in my head that I have to do. So I wear different hats. Uh, uh, PJs first and foremost. However, I create images. I prompt moments. I'll show you in a second how I prompt moments. Because whatever it takes for me to give my client the best that I feel and see, right? That's what I'm after. Is that it? Yeah. Is that prior to the wedding that, that you checked the place or you just saw No, it? no, this is at the church. In other words, you just saw it. You didn't go no. beforehand. Oh, no, no, no. I, saw, I happen to see it. I don't scout locations beforehand. There's a reason for that. Light changes. And so why have preconceived ideas in my head? Oh, yeah, so tomorrow when I, yeah, I'm going to go do this X, Y, and Z. So what am I doing when I do that? I'm thinking. I don't want to think. So on the day of the wedding, I want to feel it, see it right there on the spot without prepping for it. And I, I, I tend to, for whatever reason, maybe this, how I was brought up or why this happened to me, I work really the best under a lot of pressure. Don't go figure. Yeah, so if there's a lot, if it's too easy for me, I suck. It, it needs to have some meat to it. OK, I love this. This was a drag of the shutter, and this is me. Click, click, uh-oh. That's what I heard. Quarter second, 2.8, 70 to 200. I went, uh-oh. Film, can't see it. But do I care that she's soft because she was moving? I focused on the hands, which were tack sharp. He was standing perfectly still. He's tack sharp. His eyeglasses were tap sharp. 
she's moving towards him and she's out of focus. I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. Tells me a lot. Available light. Was I going to light this? Look at the candles in the background. No, I'm not going to throw a blowtorch out there and light them up. I just won't do it. This is what they paid me for, right? They want me to keep the integrity of what they've spent their money on. And get it, Joe. Just get it. One of my favorite all times. It's life imitating art. Uh, and this is me sneaking. There was a crack in the door. This was in a hacienda in, in Mexico. And they were getting dressed. And I saw this crack in the door. And I peeked in. I went, ooh, Lord. I opened the door, click, and closed it. It was that fast. I just happened to see it click. And the second uh, they heard the shutter, they turned around. They didn't know where it was coming from because the door was closed. Yeah. <laughs> but that's mom on the right and mother-in-law on the left. And it's like she just stepped out of that. Uh, that was just too, too perfect. That was just too crazy. All right, how about, I'm going to throw you my digital stuff. This won the grand award at WPPI last year in, in, in photojournalism. They had to debate it, though. It looked set up to them. This is actually a real moment in a church, in the voyeur of a church. And right before the ceremony, this actually happened. 70 to 200, wide open. I shot this at about 6,400 ISO. Boom, grab shot. I was gone. Done. It was that fast. And I'll show you really quickly the end, which I thought was going to win and take first place and the grand award. It did not. I thought this was an oh my god moment. It was so beautiful. And this is actually real. People say, well, there are no people in the church. Actually, this was a long church, 100 people. Everybody's in the front, and I'm in the back. And the following week, I had a wedding in the same place at the same time with the same light. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm click, 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 click. I nailed it. I come back to the studio. I open up the thing. I take a look. It's not there. What's up? I mean, why isn't it the same thing? And I study next to each other. It was how far that door was open as it was being opened that allowed the streaming of light. An inch before, an inch after, no light. No streaming of light, just backlit. So that split second, when I nailed that shot, was the split second that that light hit the edges of the doors and streamed in. It took third place because they said it was photoshopped. <laughs> but this is what judges are fearing today. Yeah. That's why I got third. They had to give it to me. Because they initially thought, that can't be real light. He, he had to photoshop the light in. Really? I went through all that trouble? Well, they don't know who I am. There's no names attached to it. But someone said, look at the raw file. I know who shot it. And trust me, it's a real shot. So I said, OK, third place. All right, slideshow. Pretty much all of it's in camera, Lightroom stuff. And that is all, folks.
so I get to this uh, island. That's my first shot. And I asked the boat captain, so where did they get married? He says, 20 years I've been doing it. Sunset time, right here. Little table, we'll have some wine right in front of the restaurant. And this whole place, Jumby Bay, is, is the resort, basically, with a, a bit of property around it. Really pretty place. I loved it. But Joe doesn't want to do the same thing, remember? I look, I say, hey, is that a sandbar? He goes, yeah. I'm thinking they should get married there. He says, no, 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 you can't. I said, why? He says, at sunset, it's underwater. I said, how deep? <laughs> he says, well, to walk out, you're mid-thigh. And when you stand, you're mid-calf. You don't want to do this. Yeah. So Kelly, I'm thinking, you, Kyle, God, in the middle of the ocean at sunset time. She says, wow. So I, where, how? So I explained to her. She says, well, how do I get to the water? She said, well, you have to walk through it. Joe, I have a $15,000 dress. I said, lift it up. <laughs> Man, walk through the water for me, please. So, and this in part, because they've seen my work and they know who I am, it's whatever Joe wants, really. They, they really want me to do my thing. So I, I'm never handcuffed, and, and I'm never told, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. And it's not a dress, you know, trash to dress thing. It's, I, I see this in my head. And so the images you're going to see is basically two cameras, 2470, 70 to 200. And there were a couple of times as I'm walking around doing this thing, the 70 to 200 is going through the water. Whoa. And I hear it's fishing, whoosh, dragging through the water. I'm dying, I'm dying, okay. And I'm just shooting, and it's available light. And as I'm facing the sunset, it's locking the meter, coming back, shooting. And then when I shift, let go of the button, fire, fire, fire. Now I'm back this way, oop, lock the meter over here, fire. So there's slightly, the background could have been bluer sky, more pronounced sunset. But I want you to look at the skin tones, because it is flawless. I brought no lighting with me. I had a flash for the evening that I took a couple shots with, but that was it. The rest of it is all available light. And you'll see this beautiful black uh, woman who is the minister, and she, 17 years she's been doing this, has never been asked to step into the ocean to perform a service. <laughs> and she had these beautiful shoes on, I said, Please, do you mind taking off your shoes and walking through the water? No, I like your idea. I'm going to take off my shoes. I'm going to stand in the water. I love this woman so much. She was spectacular. So note, available light. Two lenses, two cameras, done.
pretty good for two people. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. That was just fun to do. So, you know, again, sometimes I have to put my mind to doing it a, a different way. Uh, Jewish weddings, I'm sure here as well, when they sign ketubah, the bride doesn't always get the opportunity, if ever, to have that groom see her first time and say, oh my. Because they usually, in LA anyway, they meet in the boardroom somewhere. And as they're signing ketubah, she walks in, he's there, he, oh, hi, honey, nice dress. I mean, it's not like, oh my goodness, you know. So I'm going to show you a slideshow where this is a, a Persian Jew, uh, Mandana, and Peter is American Jew. And um, she worked out to get into this dress. She put in a lot of effort, okay. And I saw how disappointed she was that she wasn't going to get that, oh my goodness, moment of her walking down the aisle. And Peter going, oh my goodness, right. And I knew he had it in him. So here's where the psychologist hat comes on, okay? So I said, Madonna, no worries. In the house, I'll set it up. I'll put Peter in the hallway, his back to the staircase, and I'll have you come down. I'll take a few pictures, and then I'm going to have Peter turn around, and I'll be over your shoulder, and I'll get that moment where he sees you for the first time. She says, oh, that's great. So I set it up. Well, I don't tell I, neither one of them that in front of Peter is his family, his father, his mother, his sister, his aunt, his uncle. So they see her first. So they're going, oh, Peter, and Peter's going, Joe, can I turn around? No, 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 not yet, Peter, not yet. See, I'm baking him a little, see. I know what's in here, and I'm just roasting him. I, I want, by the time he turns around, to go, oh, crazy, right? Now, behind him is her family. So they see her coming down the stairs, Persians. They do that thing. I don't know how they do that. But it's really awesome. It's just really awesome. So he hears that. They're smiling in front of him. He's hearing it. He wants to turn around. I get right in front of him. I start explaining him photography 101. I said, no, Peter, hang on one second. When she comes down, I'm going to take a shot where she's in focus and you're out of focus, right? And then there's a shot of you in focus and she's out of focus. And in the book, across from it, it's really a cool moment. I, I, I don't care. You know, why am I doing that? I just want him to stew. I just want him to sit there for a while. I, I just drag this thing out because I know it's in here. So wait till you see when he turns around. I don't know what happens. So is this PJ? No. If I move a glass on a table or this thing right here is no longer photojournalism. And, and that's the God. I was a photojournalist for two years. So we can't touch these things. Now, this is a wedding. Of course you can touch it a little and move it around. I'm kind of a purist when it comes to that. I, I, don't, I don't touch anything. But is it still the truth in terms of how he was feeling? Absolutely, 100%. Did I have my hand in it? Did I coax it out of him? Absolutely, yes. But it was there. So I set these up. There's two, sh two slideshows back to back. The other one is Leanne Rimes, where I did exactly the same thing. You guys know who she is? Yeah. Okay, okay. They love each other madly, by the way. And I know everybody got to hear all the bad press about bad timing on their part. Both of them, they admit it. But they were already on the outs with their spouses, and they just suck at timing. It was bad. But I'm going to show you this thing. There's five images on Mandana's wedding of her father coming into the door. It's in black and white. And I'm going to explain it to you because every one of the frames is he's got his eyes closed. So Joe, can't you shoot him with his eyes open? Actually, no. He didn't want to see his daughter. He wanted to come in, hug her. He knelt in front of her, placed her hands on his shoulders, cried and wept as he walked out backwards. He didn't open his eyes once because he didn't want that moment until she came down the stairs. And it's just a beautiful thing. I have to explain that. You notice that I tell stories a lot? <laughs> yeah. OK, Mandana and Peter. Here we go.
<clears throat> so on that same note, I think I'm going to throw uh, Leanne and Eddie on here for a second for you guys. Yeah. Same scenario. Um, it, it, people think that there's this like, uh, when I shoot these high profile weddings, celebrity ones anyway, that this is like, oh, what a great gig I have. Actually, yeah, no. The, the no part is, it might, I, I have no freedom to shoot because there's helicopters, there's paparazzi across the street. I can't go outside. I shot Michael Jordan's wedding last weekend, okay? Phenomenal wedding. I was stuck because they had a hundred cameras sitting out on the street. What was brilliant is we had an Israeli uh, ex-military team that was security. They were brilliant. They took no prisoners. They, they were awesome. I love those guys. But it's a pain in the neck because one image gets out, and I said this earlier to a few of you, when you the ones that came early. When I did Christina Aguilera's wedding, she sold some of my images to OK Magazine, and it was like, I think, three million bucks that she got for the images. They ran it for two series. I think her wedding cost about 1.4 million, so she made 1.6 million on her own wedding. Awesome. I, I'd get married and divorced three times a year. <laughs> but it's, it's hard. It's not easy. It's, it's, it's a hard gig to do because you really are constrained in what you can and cannot do. Simply because when you see Leanne's wedding, it's outside underneath a tree. There's people with umbrellas. And yes, we're in Malibu. Sometimes it's hot and you wear an umbrella. No, they were holding up the umbrellas because of the helicopters. They were trying to get a long shot. When I shot Jennifer Lopez's wedding, there were nothing but helicopters flying about, and the coordinator was so smart, she put weather balloons at different heights up all along the property, these big giant weather balloons just tethered to this rope, right? Because it's an aircraft. So if you want to fly, you have to file a flight plan. If there's weather balloons, you can't fly there. They did anyway. So all I know is two helicopters, guys hanging out with like these long seat belts with these long 600 millimeter lenses looking down at the runner on, on, on the property. And all I know is the next thing I see is a sheriff's helicopter going up, forcing them to go down. And so they go down, right? They're down. And I look across, we're in Calabasas on a mountaintop with nothing around except other little hills, right? And little mountains. And for some reason, I see this glint. Every so often, the sun is hitting something, and it just, it's, it's like a, something is re reflecting light. And so I tell the this Israeli team was there as well. I've worked with them more than once. They're awesome. He goes over there, and they find two guys in camouflaged outfits in the bushes with power bars. They were there the night before, got up on motorcycles, dirt bikes, got into the property across the hill, and were shooting with long lenses. And what I was seeing was the mirror flipping up, hitting the sun, and reflecting back at me. How bizarre. And all he wanted to do was get one shot. So the next day, in Enquirer, there was a shot that was released that one of the guys in the helicopter got. It was of the runner with the people sitting all around no J-Lo, but one guy dressed in black with a bald head looking up. <laughs> Me. So I was the star that day. How much did they pay for the picture? Yeah, not enough, man. All right, so this is Leanne and Eddie.
<clears throat> Thank you. Also, what's really cool when I pitch like this, the way that I pitch it, is that I stay in their families. I, I, I shot the following year, which was this past year, I shot their renewal vows in Cabo San Lucas. It was just the three of us. And they, they went to the one and only Palmilla, which is an amazing hotel. It had a chapel on, on site. And they put candles, flowers, the, the whole nine yards, not a soul, a, a guitarist, flamingo guitarist in the back of the church, and me. And I documented exactly the same thing. They had the same feelings that they did in the real thing. They said all the same vows. They cried at the same places. It was really an awesome thing. And then this year, I shot her 30th birthday party. You know, she gets pregnant. I'll probably end up shooting that. It's just I end up staying in their lives because I'm just not a vendor anymore. I've become part of the family. And it all goes back to the very beginning on how I pitch myself and why I do what I do. Here's another example. I'm going to end with this slideshow. It's not always about money, OK? For me, it's my passion, and, and it, it's, the money is secondary. And you know what? If you come from that place, and you come from your heart, and you shoot from that place, money somehow follows. Don't ask me why that happens, but it happens. So this is Roy and Lisa. You guys know who Triple Scoop Music is? Yeah. OK, he's the founder. I shot his wedding five years ago. Three years ago, he asked me to come to the hospital to shoot the baby, being born. And I didn't hear from them. And next thing I know is that a half an hour after the baby was born, it died. So um, he died in her arms. They were devastated. Didn't hear from them for almost a year. I didn't, they just totally disappeared off the face of the planet. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, Roy calls me up. She said, Liza's, uh, Lisa is, is, is pregnant again. We're having the same problems. So um, she's having early Braxton Hicks contractions. She's in bed for like the last four or five months of her pregnancy, and we're going to have to do cesarean section. Will you come? I said, are you kidding? He never spoke about money, neither did I. It wasn't about the money. It, I will absolutely be there. I, I, I was so integral in the part of their wedding that I can't help be Uncle Joe. So they had to put me down as Uncle Joe in order for me to shoot in the operating room. <laughs> so I was Uncle Joe anyway, right? They let me in for this. I just want you to see why this is so crucial and why this is so important. It's at some point. She's so scared because they said they weren't sure how developed the lungs were. They were about 80%. They're still that. So she's still thinking about the year or two before when her baby, her son, died in her arms, right? And so you see her starting to get nervous and crying. Roy, with his mask on the whole time, is whispering in her ear, I have no idea what he's saying to her. I'm just shooting. I'm quiet. And I'm just being observant. And she's crying. And he's talking, he's talking. There's a couple of frames, you can't mistake it. There's this calm that comes over her. I don't know what he said, but she even smiles at him. It was a beautiful moment. And then next thing you know, the baby's born, and she starts crying again, just uncontrollable crying. And it's because when he comes out, he's screaming at the top of his lungs. You can hear him three blocks away. Okay. He also had his brother, the first time out, in him, his lungs were fine. And so that was weeping because the boy is good. His name is Gavin. He's an awesome little dude. And I'm just proud to be his uncle. So I'm showing you this because I do things like that to regenerate myself. I give of myself in terms of what I can do with the camera that has no money attached to it because it does me good. M my batteries, my soul gets filled up. I, I get to be passionate even more so because after 18 years of weddings, one can get tired sometimes, you know? You get a little burned out. So how do I refresh myself? I do stuff like this. I shoot for now I lay me down to sleep. It, it, it's, if you haven't ever heard of that, oh, reach out. It's, it's an amazing thing. It might freak you out when you shoot it, because it is kids that are dying as, after they're born, and you photograph it, whatever happens. And it's, it's an awesome experience. Um, this is Roy, Lisa, and Gavin. Can you kill the lights on this one for me? It's pretty powerful. Thank you.
Go home. Find out why you do what you do. Find out who you are. What possessed you to pick up a camera and shoot? Identify, come from that place. The hospital, did you, the hospital did you give you shooting in the, in the OR? No problem, I'm Uncle Joe. <laughs> yeah, if I was a photographer, problem. Yeah, no, I, I was uncle, yeah. But this is what it's about. The most important thing is who you are. Uh, I have a long list of people, if you're interested, if I'm in New York, and I do shoot in New York, uh, I come here at the Pierre, I shoot a lot of times, and sometimes I'm in Central Park shooting, but uh, I hire people out of wherever city I go. So I bring my uh, primary shooter with me, one of them, and then I hire either an assistant here or wherever I go to, to help me out. So if you're interested, feel free, I'll stick you on the list, okay? Thank you so much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.